So we're going to start off introductions. Um, so just so that you're all aware of who the National Cybersecurity Centre are, um, we are most commonly shortened to NCSC. We are a government agency um, and we support the most critical organisations in the UK, the wider public sector, industry, small and medium enterprises, as well as the general public. So what our main role is, is that when incidents occur, so cyber incidents occur, we provide effective incident response to min minimise harm to the UK, help with recovery and lessons learned for the future. So we're trying to make sure that you know we get people and organisations back on track as quickly as possible um, and resolve any outstanding issues that they may have following a cyber incident. So we provide a single point of contact for small and medium enterprises, um, larger organisations, government agencies, the general public and other departments. So that is working basically covering the whole of the economy in the UK. Um, so we work collaboratively with other law enforcement, defence and UK intelligence agencies and security agencies and international partners. So all of our work there regarding kind of small and medium enterprises and larger organisations, as well as government agencies and the public, is to provide advice and guidance, helping them become more cyber secure and protect, helping them to better protect themselves from cyber incidents. And I'll now pass over to the ICO to do their introduction. Thanks, Rizan. Um, and thank you to the NCSC for inviting us along to speak with you all today. Um, for those of you who don't know us, we're from the Information Commissioner's Office or ICO. We differ from the NCSC in that we're not a government department. Instead, we're the UK's independent regulator for information rights. We cover data protection and freedom of information laws. Myself and my colleague Sharice, who you'll also hear from, are from our business services department. So we speak to organisations, big and small, who need our help or advice with various parts of their data protection obligations. We're here with the NCSC to help you understand what you need to do and avoid in order to comply with data protection law. Data protection compliance is a journey. Wherever you're at on that journey, the ICO is here to help. So the start of that journey is understanding what personal data is. So personal data is something which identifies a living person, but also relates to them. In other words, it tells you something about them. Identifies doesn't only mean that their name is included, but could also mean that you can tell who someone is via other information, for example, their job title. So if you're reading about the current information commissioner, you will know you're reading about John Edwards. So why is data protection so important for your business? We live in an age where our personal data is everywhere. We do more and more online, from buying our groceries and paying our bills, chatting with our friends, managing our finances, and even checking how much electricity we use in our homes. Our choice of music and films, the clothes we buy, and sometimes even the medical advice we seek are all logged online. And with this growing use of electronic personal data, there's a growing awareness amongst people about their data rights and their privacy. Nowadays, we're more likely to question what an organisation is going to do with our personal data and how they'll look after it. So it's vitally important that if you are gathering people's personal information, you need to make sure you're protecting it. And this includes keeping it from falling into the hands of online criminals. Don't worry, though, we have lots of resources to help you protect people's personal information. We have a web hub that's specifically written for small and medium enterprises, including sole traders, small businesses, clubs and charities. The guidance is in easy to read sections and will tell you what you need to know to set you off on your data protection journey. If you need further help with any data protection issues, we also have live service teams to answer your questions. The details for, the, uh, the details for these you'll see on the final slide today. 
Our services are confidential and our priority with small businesses is to provide advice and guidance that enables you to build and grow your business. We'll now talk you through some tips to help keep your business's data secure. We're not going to focus on cyber security specifically. Obviously, we're going to leave that to the experts at NCSC. So first of all, when you send in information out by email, make sure you name your documents clearly and check you're sending the right attachments. If you forward in email chains, make sure they don't contain any information that the recipient shouldn't see and always double check email addresses before pressing send. If you have an autofill function on your email system, it's a good idea to disable it. We receive a lot of reports of data breaches caused because someone started to type a name and their system auto populated the wrong person from their contact list. It's essential to be extra vigilant about opening web links and attachments in emails or other messages. Don't click on or open any which are unexpected or come from an unknown source. And if you are unsure, it's completely fine to contact the source of the email first to make sure that they haven't had a phishing attack themselves. You should also set your user accounts with strong passwords and make sure all of your devices lock when they're left for a certain period. We recommend making strong passwords using at least 10 characters with numbers and symbols. It's also important to avoid using the same password for multiple accounts. Also think about whether you need to hold all data as personal data. Is it worth fully anonymizing it by removing the name or other identifiers? This is particularly useful if you're keeping information for general business statistics only, and it can help to reduce the risk of personal data being mishandled or misused. Also, to avoid loss or theft of personal data, put any printouts or devices away at the end of the working day if possible. Now, we know a lot of you are probably working from home these days, so you may be sharing your home working space with other family members or friends. Try to hold conversations where people are less likely to overhear you and position your screen where it won't be seen by other people. In an office setting, it's likely you can use confidential waste bins. At home, you probably don't have those facilities. So to keep your documents secure, only print something if you absolutely have to. And once you're finished with it, shred the papers using a cross cut shredder. Don't just put them straight in the bin. Anybody could get hold of them. And if you're sharing your device with members of your family, for example, if your children use it for homework or playing games, keep your own work files separate. Give yourself a separate login account and a password to protect it. Another thing you need to be aware of is the requirement to delete personal data when you no longer need it. There are so many benefits to only keeping the information you actually need and securely disposing of any that you don't. The less personal data you have, the less information will be at risk of a personal data breach. Plus, you'll have lower storage costs. The first thing to do is identify what personal data you hold about other people and why you're holding it. Think about what you need it for and how long you should keep it. It might be that you hold people's data because you need to comply with legislation relevant for your sector. If so, then a specific retention period may already be set out. But data protection legislation itself doesn't set specific retention periods. If you're only retaining personal data in relation to the services you're providing, you'll need to set your own retention periods. You can keep the personal data you need for as long as it's necessary to do so. But keep in mind, you shouldn't hold on to personal data just in case. You might want to consider how long someone may use your service. You'll need to document your reasons for the retention period you've decided on, and this should be regularly reviewed. Any personal information you no longer need should be securely deleted. Complying with the UK GDPR and this storage limitation principle will also help you minimise the risk caused by a cyber incident. On that note, it's great timing to hand you back to the NCSC, who will talk to you about the importance of cyber security. Thank you. So I wanted to start with kicking off about what is cyber security? 
So cyber specifically relates to computer systems, networks, including the internet and devices in general. And when we say devices, we mean things like your mobile phones, your laptops, tablets, etc. Anything that uses the internet. So cybersecurity, its core cool function is to protect the devices we all use and the services we access both online and at work from being compromised. So that can be anything from internet banking to submitting your tax return, um, to using your mobile phone to message somebody um, and any of the other services um, that you would use your devices for. So it could even be your um, smart hub um, like Alexa or, or Google as well. So it is important about preventing unauthorised access to the vast amounts of personal information you store on these devices and online. As you can imagine, um, you know, you store telephone numbers, you might have pictures of people on your devices, um, you might have bank details on your devices as well. So it's all important that cybersecurity protects those as well as the devices themselves. Cybersecurity is important because smartphones, computers and the internet are part of modern life. We all use them, we're using devices today. So from online banking and shopping to email and social media. So you might be asking, why is my organisation at risk? I'm only a small business, why would they target me? So regardless of the size or nature of your business, the information you hold is valuable to a criminal. So they try and most common cyber attacks for organisations are things like phishing emails, and you've probably received these in your private life as much as your work life, where somebody says you've won a prize, um, you've been selected, um, you know, you, you've won a competition, like loads of different information. And it might be down to something, especially if you're a business, it might be down to invoices. So they might say you haven't paid this invoice, here are the bank details, please pay it urgently, when actually in fact, you have paid the invoice and this is just somebody pretending to be that outside company. Ransomware is another risk for small organisations. This is where your data is encrypted on your device and can only be released with the payment of a ransom. However, this is not always the case. The NCSC and Action Fraud will help you with any kind of cyber incident or fraud. The other most common cyber attacks that we see and we'll go into this in more detail later on in the presentation is social media hacking and email hacking where people get into your accounts and access the information from there so occasionally people might you might see a post on social media saying this business account has been hacked here is our new one or don't follow this account it it's a duplication of ours it's not real even if you don't lose money directly, a data breach, which is where information is stolen or accessed without authorization, could cause a temporary shutdown of your business while the breach is investigated and damage to your reputation with customers and partners. So that can be that you won't be able to trade, especially if it's ransomware, you won't be able to access anything until it, it's resolved. So it might mean that you delay customer orders, um, you might not be able to contact your customers or suppliers, um, you might get reputational damage um, because we could, well, you know, there's a delay, they've had a cyber attack, I don't want to deal with them anymore. So loads of different reasons that a business could be temporarily shut down to resolve the incident. Sometimes that's not the case with email hacking, that's not normally the case, it's just changed in the password, making sure you've got your two-factor authentication, and maybe you might decide to send out an email to anybody that you feel has been contacted to say, look, I was my email was hacked, but we've resolved it. We're quite happy that everything is now um, back in order and there's no risk to anything. So who and what is Action Fraud? So I mentioned earlier about Action Fraud. They are the UK's National Reporting Centre for Fraud and Cybercrime. So where you should, they are where you should report fraud if you have been scammed, defrauded or experienced a cyber crime in England, Wales and Northern Ireland. But this is not the case for Scotland. Scotland are still referring to the police call centre. So that's 999 if it's an emergency and threatening into life or endangerment. And it's 101 if it's not a threat to life or an endangerment to a person. So when you report to Action Fraud, you will receive a police crime reference number. In some cases, you will have insurance to cover you for cybercrime. They will need that police cybercrime reference number. So reports are taken and passed to the National Fraud Intelligence Bureau that then pass them on to the police should they be um, needing 
to be investigated further by local forces, which could be the police protect network um, or others as well. But on the bottom of the screen you see there is the website for action fraud. You can go, they've got loads of different information on there, but it's also where you can report them. They have also got a telephone number there um, on the red banner at the bottom, which is 0300 123 2040. So you can either, if you have a cyber incident or experience fraud, you can go to their website and complete the form, or you can phone them um, and discuss it with them there, and they can give you some advice and guidance on how, how to resolve or, or deal with the um, situation. So as I mentioned, Action fraud is where people should report um, and we advise people to report cybercrime and fraud too. So in the last year, they've had 2,379 reports. Now, we do expect this number to be a lot higher if we're looking at how many cyber incidents or fraud incidents there are across England, Wales and Northern Ireland. This is the reason that people don't report is sometimes they don't know that they have they should. Um, they're not happy. Um, to engage with the law enforcement, they think, OK, it's resolved, end of. Um, and a lot of times it's sometimes reputational. People are worried that if they say that they've had um, a cyber incident, that people won't come to them, won't want to work with them, when actually, if you've experienced a cyber incident, you're more likely to have put things in place to stop it from happening in the future, like your two-factor authentication, your automatic updates and backups. So you could actually be a safer organisation than when before you had a cyber incident and to other organisations. But if we go back to the slide, so 2,379 reports. Of those reports, the majority of them were from smaller businesses. So as you can see there, 730 of the reports were from organisations with one to nine employees. So we're looking at the micro organisations. The next biggest number on there is 470, and that's from 10 to 49 employees. So as I mentioned, very small compared to, to others. When you get to more than 250 employees, which goes to our medium sized businesses, only 226 reports. As I mentioned at the beginning, we do expect these numbers to be a lot higher, but people aren't reporting um, at the moment. And we're trying to really encourage organisations to report as much as they can because it helps us build a picture of who the cyber criminals are, how they're targeting business, and what the trends are within the UK so that we can produce more advice and guidance resources to help resolve or help better protect organisations. So small and medium enterprises are attractive victims for cyber criminals. This is because they normally have a lack of cyber security, employee awareness, people don't understand what they're looking for, for example, like a phishing email, um, and they're normally connected to larger businesses. A lot of SMEs in the UK are part of much larger supply chains, and it could be a route for cyber criminal to go through that smaller business to get to the larger target. And the data is normally available to exfiltrate because it's not password protected, it's not encrypted. Um, they can normally get it quite easily. So why should businesses implement cybersecurity? As I mentioned, the figures on the other screen are the reports to action fraud. But the top three types of cybercrime are hacking by extortion, which costs businesses, oh, sorry, which costs businesses around four million pounds last year. We then have hacking from social media and email, and again, this cost businesses around 1.8 million last year. Then the third um, of the cyber crimes that were in the top three was computer virus, malware, spyware, which is 24 and a half thousand pounds. So just to recap, 39% of the reports were from businesses with less than 1.5 million turnover. They're obviously Small businesses are often targeted predominantly because they're less sophisticated in cybersecurity, but we'll get on to how we can help your business be better and protected from cyber instances. 31% of the reports from hacking social media and email. So 31% with a cost of 1.8 million is a huge number. And as I mentioned, we expect these to be a lot higher. There was 11 million pounds worth of losses through business email compromise as well. So that could be loss of time, loss of business, loss of orders, um, anything a financial loss as well um, and then in the bottom right hand corner you've got the figures of 25 percent 20 percent for the one to nine employees and 10 to 49 employees so you're looking at kind of 45 percent of those reports were from those very small businesses so what can you do to better protect your organization the ncc has a huge range of resources available to businesses of all sizes sectors and maturity in cyber. 
So the first thing that we would urge you to do is to use two step verification, which is sometimes referred to as 2SV. And you may have heard it as 2FA or MFA, two factor authentication, multi factor authentication. And we would urge you to um, do this on any of your business critical accounts. This could be finance, personal data, employee data, um, or anything else that you feel needs to be protected. And most services, online services and devices, can have this enabled. You normally just have to go to the settings option and there'll be an option there to enable the two-step verification. And two-step verification is where you get, um, you log in and then you get another code. So you might get a text message to your phone, you might be asked to use an authenticator app, and or it might be that your fingerprint or um, facial recognition, depending on your device, is the other side of the verification. The other thing we would ask you to do is to create and store backups. Now these can be on, on the cloud, so OneDrive, um, iCloud, anything like that. External hard drives such as USBs or actual external hard drives or anywhere else that you feel is appropriate. Make things automatic. So what we're asking you to do is we're not expecting businesses to remember each month to go and do the update or, or to back up or however often they feel it is relevant. So there are numerous things that you can do such as automatic backups and updates. These will automatically do to your device. So with the updates, normally they download overnight, um, so that it's there next time. So they do it in downtime and you're not using the device, it's not disrupting you. And it's really easy to turn these on. All you normally have to do is go to the settings option and there'll be an option for automatic backups and automatic updates and you just turn those on and it will do it for you. You won't have to worry about remembering to do that each month. The next thing about staff awareness and training. So it's really important that as a business owner, you understand the cyber risk, you understand the processes and you put things in place to reduce that risk. But also your staff are kind of the, the front of your business. So you might have a call centre, you might have um, somebody managing the email mailbox for you. And it's important that those um, employees also understand cyber security and what they need to do and what the processes are for your business. So do they know what the normal process is for somebody you know, requesting payment of an invoice? Would they notice if a phishing email came in saying that you hadn't paid an invoice and the payment was due urgently and here are the bank details? Would they realise that you know they need to double check that and maybe contact um, the actual company um, through a different means to confirm whether they have or have not been paid? So things like that. And we'll get on to more on how the NCC can help with staff awareness training. We then have turn on anti-malware and antivirus software. Most devices have this installed. All you need to do is to turn it on. And again, this is normally within the settings or control panel option. And the last thing on there is to limit what information is shared on your website or social media profile. So do your visitors to your website or your customers need to know everything and what details are necessary? So do they need to know what your CEO's name is? Do they need to know where they grew up, where they went to school, what their history is? Probably not because that information can be gleaned by cyber criminals to access accounts or to work out passwords. Or sometimes your um, memorable information is where you went to school, where did you grow up, where were you born, where is your mother's maiden name, and sometimes that information is included in those kind of biographies for um, senior managers. Also, do if you're an online only company, do they need to know where your company is based? They may not, they may do. So it's really important that you go away and look for your website and your social media just to check what information is on there and that you're happy for anybody to access that information. And if not, I would suggest removing it. So what resources are available to help me? Well, the first thing we have over here is the Cyber Aware Online Tailored Action Plan. And you'll receive links to all of these after this webinar via an email. So the Cyber Aware Online Tailored Action Plan is a short questionnaire, asks you if you do your backups, yes, no, don't know, asks you if you do your um, loads of other questions, so updates, things like that. And dependent on your answers, at the end of the questionnaire, it will provide you with a tailored action plan and it will say, this is the most important thing. You said you don't um, do automatic backups. We would encourage you to do automatic backups and here is how you can set them up on the most common devices and it gives you a how-to guide for each of those. Some people will complete the cyberware questionnaire and get an action plan and it will say no actions. That's absolutely fine. You might then move on to the small business guide, which takes the advice and guidance from cyberware if you had any actions and develops a bit more. So instead of saying about just automatic backups, 
it will start asking you where you're backing up and what information are you backing up? Do you need to back up everything? Or is there just certain information that you do regularly? And then maybe once a month you do a big backup or once every six months you do um, everything backs up. So as mentioned, so CyberAware has a tailored action plan through questions. The Small Business Guide also has an actions checklist that you can download and you'll receive a link to this after the webinar where you can tick off the, the actions that you do um, and see which ones we suggest that maybe you don't do or need to look further into. We also have the Small Organisations Monthly Newsletter. This is sent out from the NCSC and includes information from our partner organisations such as Action Fraud, ICO and others. It also includes information about the latest news from the NCC. So it might be a new piece of guidance, new service. We might be looking for user testing on, on certain new products to make sure that they are relevant to the organisations we're targeting. Majority of them will be small businesses and small and charities, um, as well as anything else that we include. So it might be that we have a new report from Action Fraud on the latest trends of cybercrime, things like that. So it's really interesting um, and people can sign up to that. And we have over 5,000 um, recipients at the moment. Um, we also have threat awareness videos. So this is where I was talking about staff training. Um, so we have phishing, ransomware and then people centred security. So it introduces the topic, explains a bit about it. Um, and then how to kind of manage that if you do get a phishing email or a ransomware, um, how you can manage that in your organisation. Again, with staff training, we have the 15 minute micro exercises as part of our exercise in a box tool. Um, so this tool contains numerous different exercises. I think there's about 18 to 20 in total. There's a simulation exercise. There's a three to five hour discussion based exercises. But for most small organisations, we would suggest doing the 15 minute micro exercises, which can either be done as an individual or as a team and cover topics such as supply chain security, phishing emails, ransomware from a phishing email, amongst others. We also have the e-learning, so top tips for staff and cybersecurity for small organisations. These are bite sized learning that can be done um, a module at a time or in one go and would take no longer than a few hours to complete um, if somebody is doing them in one go. They are SCORM files, so they can be downloaded into your own training platforms or they can be accessed via the links that you will receive after this webinar. Then we have a couple of other services. So early warning service is something we would urge most organisations to sign up to. So it is a service run by the NCSC. You have to register with your IP address, um, which you can find in your on your device and there is guidance on our website on how to find your IP address as well as an email address that you're willing to be contacted on should the service find something. So what the service will do is notify you of any um, thing that it thinks is suspicious um, or any vulnerabilities that they have found. So for example, the, a couple of years ago we had the Microsoft Exchange server vulnerability. Any organisations that we were aware of that were using that had a notification to, to check that vulnerability and steps on how to mitigate that as well and resolve it. Again, on early warning, um, you can, as I said, you can receive notifications. We had one the other day where somebody had a precursor to ransomware and we were able to notify them through that service and they were able to put steps in place and to resolve it. And I've just seen a message in the chat that somebody says early warning service is great. Um, we also have basic cyber check, which is coming soon. So early next year we'll have a new service again it's with your IP address you don't need to put in an email for this one you just put in an IP address within a second you'll get back whether there's any vulnerabilities on there um, so that will be coming out in the new year so have a look out for that and again that will be mentioned in our newsletter in the January edition um, and then a couple of last things we have supply chain security guidance um, so if you are part of the supply chain you might want to look at kind of how you can, if you're doing really well at cybersecurity, how you can check that who your customers are also, you know, putting cybersecurity practices in place, a bit about contracts and what to include there as well. And then lastly, if you're unsure of where to report a cyber incident or you're not sure what what to do or who to contact, the gov.uk has just launched a new service called Where to Report a Cyber Incident. And again, you'll see the link to this after this webinar. If you go on there, and answer a few questions about the incident, it will direct you to the right authority to report to. So if you're in Scotland, it will direct you to the police. It might direct you to Action Fraud. It might direct you to um, our colleagues at the ICO, and it might say about NCSC as well. So it's worth using that if you are unsure. But as I mentioned earlier, in the first instance, all cyber incidents and fraud should be reported to Action Fraud. So I'll pass back to the ICO now to talk about personal data breaches. 
Thank you. Some really great resources there to help keep your business's data secure. But if the worst does happen and you experience an incident that includes the loss or theft of personal data, or your system is accessed by a third party who could have seen personal information they shouldn't have, you've had a personal data breach. A personal data breach is a breach of security leading to the accidental or unlawful destruction, loss, alteration, unauthorised disclosure of or access to personal data. In other words, something's gone wrong. Now you may need to report this. Personal data breaches must be reported to the ICO unless it's unlikely that there's been a risk to anyone. Where feasible, you must report within 72 hours of becoming aware of the breach. When deciding whether to report, the first thing you need to do is consider the implications. What's the potential risk to the people affected? Each breach should be looked at on a case by case basis and all aspects of the incident considered. So we know from calls that we take on our data breach helplines that assessing the risk to people and therefore deciding whether an incident needs to be reported to the ICO is consistently the main area in which organisations need our advice. So we're going to take you through what we mean by risk and what factors you should consider when assessing an incident. The focus of risk when we're looking at reporting a breach will always be the negative consequences for the people affected. There'll always be other risks for you to consider, such as the risk to your reputation or financial loss. But your first response from the ICO's point of view should be to look at the risk to the people affected and think about any steps you can take to reduce that risk or help them in some other way. So some examples of possible consequences are listed on the slide. Um, so these are emotional distress, discrimination, identity theft or fraud, financial loss, damage to reputation, or any other significant emotional or social disadvantage to the person concerned. Some breaches will cause little risk beyond inconvenience to someone, while others can have significant consequences. Look at all the relevant factors when considering risk. If the breach is likely to cause a high risk to people, you must let them know what's happened, what you're doing to put it right, and any measures they can take to protect themselves. So you'll need to consider the following factors when assessing risk. Uh, these will be relevant for cyber incidents, but also for any other type of personal data breach. So first of all, we're looking at what type of breach is it? A personal data breach is something that affects the confidentiality, availability or integrity of the information you hold. An incident where information has been disclosed to someone who shouldn't see it will cause a different set of consequences than an incident which has resulted in information no longer being available. Another key factor in your assessment will be the type of personal data that has been compromised, how sensitive this may be and the volume of data involved. Typically, the more sensitive the information, the higher the risk of harm will be. Breaches that involve identity documents, financial or health data can all cause harm on their own, but together this volume of data could be used for identity theft. When thinking about what data has been disclosed, consider whether the role of your organisation also reveals something about an individual. For example, you could infer more information from the mailing list of a charity that supports individuals with a specific medical condition than you could from the list of an estate agent. Also, look at who is affected. A breach could involve the personal data of children or vulnerable people, which may place them at a greater risk of harm. There may also be other factors about the people involved, which could affect how a breach may impact them. Look at how many people are affected. Generally, the higher the number, the higher the potential impact of a breach. This is not to say that a breach needs to affect large numbers of people to cause a risk though. A breach affecting a single person could still have significant consequences. 
or so, look at how easily someone with access to the compromised data could identify who it related to. If the information was encrypted, for example, a person without the decryption key wouldn't be able to access it. Consider who has access to the compromised data. With a cyber incident, it's likely that this would be an unknown party. For other breaches, it could be an individual that uses your service or another organisation that you have an ongoing relationship with. If there's been a disclosure, did the recipient proactively contact you to advise of the breach? Consider whether you feel the recipient would use the information in an unauthorised or malicious way, or whether you can trust them to delete the information as requested. Look at whether the incident is contained. Consider whether the data is back under the control of your organisation. Has the unintended recipient confirmed that they've securely destroyed or deleted the information? Have you located data that you thought was lost? Have you remotely wiped the laptop that was stolen or have you changed your system passwords? Finally, consider if there are any further actions you can take to reduce the risk. The faster you act, the greater the chance of stopping what may have been a small problem from becoming a big problem. So, if you have experienced a personal data breach and you aren't confident in saying that the risk to people is unlikely, you must report that breach to us at the ICO. You can do this by phoning us or you can fill in the form that's on our website. For cyber incidents, we'd prefer you to use the form if possible. You should report to us within 72 hours of becoming aware of the breach. If you don't have all the information we ask for, just tell us what you know for now and give us an estimation of the numbers and type of data affected. You can always provide extra information at a later date. Letting us know what's happened quickly will allow us to give you advice regarding next steps and possible mitigating actions. Whatever's happened, it's really important to learn from what's gone wrong. You should keep an internal log of the incident, including what happened, the effects of the breach, and the actions that you took to address it, whether or not you decide it needs to be reported. You should also look to put measures in place to stop something similar from happening again in the future. If it's a cyber incident that you've had, revisit the advice that the NCSE have told you today. And as always, if you are unsure about how to handle an incident, you can give us a call and talk through what's happened with one of our colleagues. We do know that organisations are sometimes fearful of calling us because they hear a lot about fines for data breaches in the news. But you do need to remember that we issue very few fines compared to the number of breach reports we receive. We reserve our fining power for the most serious of cases. And if you've experienced a reportable breach, it's always better that we hear about it from you rather than from someone else. And I do think that most people who have called us to discuss a breach agree that we're very friendly and helpful and that we definitely put them at ease. So I'll now hand back to the NCSC, who will talk about the additional obligations when reporting cyber incidents. Thank you. So as I mentioned earlier, if you have a cyber incident or suffer from fraud, you need to report it to Action Fraud and their website is on the screen as well as their telephone number. They also have a 24 seven live cyber reporting service. This is for businesses that are currently suffering a live cyber attack, so an attack that is in progress. And again, it's the same number as above, but you would just be directed through the options um, to somebody that can help you. If you are located in Scotland, you need to contact Police Scotland on 101 unless it's a threat to life or endangerment, and then it's the 999 number. In addition to Action Board, you can report it to the NCSC via our website, and at the top right hand side, you will see an option for report to the NCSC. When you report to the NCSC, it's not a guarantee that we will help you. We do triage incidences and the most critical ones we will help you with but we may provide advice and guidance to smaller incidences as well. In certain circumstances, as mentioned by the Information Commissioner's Office, you will need to report to them within 72 hours of being aware of the incident. And you can do that through their website or via the other information that they gave to you. Reporting, you can report a phishing email by forwarding emails to report at phishing.gov.uk. And this will be then looked into and the URLs are normally taken down. 
You can also report those scam texts that you get. So maybe it's a missed parcel, um, it's your bank saying somebody's trying to access your account and stuff. You can forward those texts to 7726 and your telephone service provider will look into that and remove the number from the database. They should not be able to continue with that work once they've been taken down. So again, if you have a phishing email, it's report at phishing.gov.uk and to forward scam text, the number is 7726 and you will receive a notification once you've sent the text. So we now move on to the question and answer session um, and we have some questions already in, in the Q&A box, but if you have any further ones, please do add them. The Q&A option can be found at the top of your um, taskbar um, on this screen. But I'll kick off with a couple of questions um, for the NCSC. So somebody always asks us, what piece of cyber advice would we give to any organisation? And the piece of advice, advice that I would give is automatic updates and backups. If you can turn them on, do them. They really help if you were unfortunate enough to suffer from a ransomware attack. Having those backups available that if you had to purchase a new device, you could download the backup and keep your business running really helps you get back on track as quick as possible. And the other question I have is, do I need to register to use any of the NCSC resources mentioned? The majority of the resources you do not need to register for. They are available on the website ncsc.gov.uk. There are, however, certain circumstances that you will need to provide more information. So, for example, early warning service, you will need to register with an email address and the IP address for your devices. Again, exercise in a box, you do have to say which sector you're in. This is purely so that we'll make sure that there are exercises there for everybody, every size and every type of organisation, that there's something there. Um, again, there may be a couple of other resources that you come across on the NCSC website, which will ask you to register, but the majority of them should be available to anybody. Um, I'll pass over to the ICA because I know that they have a couple of questions as well that they've received. Thanks, Rosanne. So, yeah, I can see that there's a question. Um, looks like it's for us in the Q&A uh, section. So this says you mentioned about emailing attachments. Is this best practice? We prefer to email links to SharePoint or equivalent rather than attachments. So there's a dual layer of security as a recipient of the email and permissions to link would need to be incorrect to cause a breach. Um, so in regards to emailing attachments, um, it's it's just kind of a common uh, breach that we see reported, which is why we've kind of mentioned it. Um, we would kind of definitely recommend password protection um, on email uh, email attachments if you're sending those out, um, particularly if they are going to you know contain sensitive personal information. Um, when supplying the password, we'd recommend kind of doing that by some sort of different means. So whether that's a text you can send um, or a phone call, um, probably avoid doing it by email because if you've sent it to the wrong place um, initially you may well end up sending the password to the wrong place as well and that's not great um, so having that kind of double layer of security um, is definitely preferable. Um, in terms of email and links to SharePoint I think Nadir kind of raises a good point um, in their comment to your question have a look at how your system's set up. Um, so it could be that if you're kind of sent, um, if you're sending it from SharePoint, it might be that the incorrect email gets access. Um, so check how that is set up just to make sure that it is kind of working in the way that you think it is. Um, and Anthony as well kind of raises a good point in that, you know, even if it is kind of working in that way where the incorrect recipient might have access, you're still going to be able to kind of, you know, restrict access or remove access in some um, systems, which is a good way of containing a breach like this, um, which is if you're just kind of using a typical kind of email software where you can't do that, obviously that's not an option. So it allows you that containment, which you wouldn't typically get. Um, but yeah, like I'd say, password protection is probably best for email um, attachments if you're doing that. If you do have another system that you use, just make sure that, you know, you are aware of how it works properly and that you think you're getting the protection that you are out of that. Um, Sharice, I don't think we've got any more in the Q&A at the minute. Um, so Sharice um, can comment on some kind of common sort of questions that we get. Uh, you've jumped ahead again a little bit there, Katie. Um, so we have just got one that I think it popped into the chat rather than the Q&A. Um, so I'll just cover that one if it's OK. Um, so does address data with no names attached 
classify as personal question. So firstly, well done. You've hit on a question that we do get asked quite a lot um, at the ICO, and it is about this distinction as to what's personal data and what isn't. So as Katie mentioned earlier in her definition, personal data is any information which identifies and relates to um, a, a living individual, essentially. Now, an address on its own, if there's no name attached to it, usually won't identify somebody but I would suggest that you treat that with caution because what you do have to do when deciding whether something is personal data is um, basically determine whether it could be interpreted as personal data if it's paired with any information that's available to the reasonable person. So if there's any other information that could be paired with an address which would suggest um, who the address relates to or anything else relating to a living individual um, then it would be recommended to treat it as personal data and like I would suggest in any circumstances it's always better to be cautious so if you are unsure about whether something is personal data or not treat it as, as though it is just so you've taken the opportunity to put those extra precautions and measures in place um, and then if it wasn't you've still protected it and if it was great it is protected um, so as far as I can see that's all that I the questions that are addressed for us within the chat and the Q&A. Um, I can see that there's one for the NCSC. So Roseanne, I don't know if you want, want to take that one now. Yeah, I can do. So the question in the Q&A is um, from Steve, who's asked, said you gave out some figures for the cost of business, cost to business from cybercrime. Where do these figures come from? So they come from the action fraud and they only relate to those businesses that we showed on the screen, the smaller businesses. The cost that you've got in your question, um, so the cost of cybercrime, which was a joint government and industry report, quoted the cost to businesses of £21 billion per annum. So this could incl include large national and international companies. Um, that's why that figure is probably a lot higher than the figure that I gave. Um, so hopefully that answers your question. Um, and I'm just going to pass back to the ICO because there is another question in the chat from Stephen. He asks if I need to email personal data, does it need to be encrypted or is password protecting the attachment adequate? I think you might have briefly just covered this, Katie. Um, let me have a quick look for, is it in the Q&A? Yes, oh yeah, if I need to get my personal data, does it need to be encrypted or password protecting it? Um, it will depend, essentially. Um, you know, the more sensitive the personal data you are um, sending, you know, the higher level of security you should have essentially. Um, it also depends kind of what sort of resources you've got available to you in your business. Um, obviously we don't want to prescribe but you've got to have something that potentially is out of your resources to do so. Um, so it's about having appropriate measures in place. So if you've got kind of the capacity in a, to encrypt it then do that because that's going to be kind of a, a, a better standard. But if not um, then you know do what you can with the resources you've got available and what's appropriate for your business. Um, can't see any more currently for us. Sharice, do you want to cover something that's kind of commonly asked to us? Uh, yeah, sure, no problem. So, um, yeah, as as we can't see any at the moment, um, I don't want to sort of waste this time that we've got with you. We want to give you as much information as we can. Um, so I'll just cover off a question that we do get quite often um, in relation to personal data breaches on our helplines and live chats. Um, so is it a breach if colleagues are discussing information that they're entitled to know and someone else overhears this? So it's probably best to demonstrate this one with an example. Um, so let's let's say there's two members of HR and they're discussing someone's termination of employment and another member of staff from a different department, uh, let's call them person C, overhears this. So let's assume the two people in HR have authority firstly to be privy to this information and also to be having this discussion, but the person who overheard it doesn't. So this would be a personal data breach certainly. So think back to my earlier definition of a personal data breach. Um, here there's been an unauthorised disclosure by the people in HR and this has given person C unauthorised access to that information. So as I explained earlier it's essential to have conversations in places where you can't be heard uh, overheard so uh, that's both when you're working from home when you're in the office or even if you're traveling so if you sat on a train with colleagues things like that this is particularly important where sensitive material is being discussed so thinking back to the example that I've given 
think about the potential consequences to the person being talked about here. It may mean um, that their situation is spread around the office or that they're treated differently by person C because of this disclosure. And this could have been very easily prevented by having this private conversation in a separate private room. So just to emphasize there, it is really important to think about um, your location when having conversations which um, where people are discussed really. Um, so just summarising on that one. So Katie, I think we have actually had another question through um, if you're available to take that one. Yep, absolutely. So we've got one in the Q&A and it says if as a sole trader, my website is hacked and my personal details are compromised, but nobody else's are, do I still have to report it to the ICO? So when we're looking at reporting breaches, it's about the information that your organisation is a controller for. So, you know, information about your customers, your employees and um, things like that. So if it's just kind of your own information from kind of a personal point of view that's been compromised, um, then it's probably not something that you'll need to be reporting to us. Um, we're really looking for the information that your business uses. Um, so if that was compromised, so if some of your customers' information was compromised and you felt like there was a risk to them as a result of that, um, that would be something that you would need to report to us. Um, is the I think Sharice, have you got one more for us? Uh, yes, I have, Katie, thank you. Um, so just another question that's popped through. Um, I'll just read it out first. So I want to have a new app to develop an app of new app developed by a software agency to hold my customers data. Who is legally responsible for data protection in this situation? As a small business, how can I ensure the software agency is taking appropriate data protection and security measures? OK, so I'll just take the first part of that question first. Um, so in this situation, you would be uh, what we call the data controller. And this means that you're the body or the business who is instructing somebody to act on your behalf. So you're making those independent decisions, firstly, to even collect that information and to run this app. So the software agency would be processing the personal data on, on your behalf. They would be holding it because you've asked them to and they would be um, developing this new app. So you would be primarily responsible for the data protection compliance because you're the data controller. But it is important to emphasize that anybody who processes personal data is responsible for making sure that they do so in line with the law so that they do have those security measures in place. So that means that although you're primarily responsible, the software agency would also be subject to those obligations as well. Now coming to the second part of that question, uh, so I'll just repeat that. So how can I ensure the software agency is taking appropriate data protection and security measures? You're obliged to put a contract in place with the data processor. And that basically sets out what you're expecting them to do in relation to the personal data. So that will set out their obligations and you will basically send that to them and they would have to sign it and they would be bound by that contract. So that's a way to, to make sure that they are taking those a, a appropriate data protection and security measures. Um, and then if something was to go wrong, you, you've got that contract there. You can you can withdraw from the relationship um, and and basically it puts that obligation on them to make sure that they are meeting those requirements. The other thing that I would recommend doing before even get into the point of a contract is to have a look into that software agency. So you'll be able to see online that they'll have a privacy policy which talks about how they process people's personal data and you can have a look there because that will talk about what security measures they use and that will make sure that you're essentially going in with your eyes open um, and you'll be able to make an informed decision essentially. Um, so I'm thinking that we do have another question in the chat. Um, so I'll just pop you back through to Katie. Yeah, lots of questions for us here. So we've got one that says when an employee leaves, they may have retained paperwork with personal data of customers or service users. Is there liability for this uh, for the employer as there's no way to guarantee everything is returned or destroyed by the employee? Um, so, yes, essentially, there would be a liability for the employer there. Um, you know, it's the employer's obligation to kind of keep the data that they're processing as part of their business secure. Now, 
there are various things that you, you kind of should be doing with your employees um, in relation to what their obligations are. So first of all, obviously training, um, you want to make it quite clear to them what it is they can and what they shouldn't be doing with the data that they've got access to as part of their employment. Um, you could also put clauses in contracts um, that kind of um, set out what should be done with the personal data um, as part of their employment. So they've got kind of like that avenue there as well. Um, and also, you know, you can look at doing, you know, exit interviews or things like that, or kind of reminding employees at the end of their employment, um, you know, that they need to kind of return everything to you, um, you know, reminding them of the clauses that are in their contracts, that sort of thing. Now, obviously, you know, we understand as a regulator, um, sometimes you can do everything right. Um, and if an employee kind of wants to, you know, take data that they had legitimate access to, sometimes they might be able to do that. Um, so while, yes, there is a liability for you kind of as an organisation, as an employer, we are, you know, pragmatic in our regulation. And what we're looking for is to see that you had kind of the appropriate measures in place beforehand to kind of prevent something like this happening. And we obviously want to see that you've taken appropriate steps to kind of handle it um, kind of after the incident. So kind of making contact with the employee if you, you know, if you suspect they might have taken something, um, you know, making it clear to them that they didn't have authority to do this, asking them to delete it, you know, trying to get some sort of written confirmation from them um, that they've destroyed that. Um, so that's what we're kind of looking for. We want to see that you've handled it correctly because obviously, you know, that's what we're concerned with your organisation um, and how you're handling data. So yes, a liability, but you know, if you've done the relevant things, obviously we're going to be pragmatic in kind of how we regulate that. Um, and Sharice, I think you've got another for us. Uh, I have indeed. So I'll just read it out again okay. first. So as um, a sole trader, I hold a spreadsheet with data about clients and leads, including representatives of those businesses, brackets, name and email. Do I need to register as a business with the ICO? Um, so most businesses do need to register with the Information Commission's office, um, but it does generally depend on what personal data you're processing and whether it's electronically. So there's certain processing which always needs to be registered, so things like CCTV, uh, but there are also some exemptions, uh, which means that you don't need to register. So um, what I would suggest, given on what you said with the question, it may be that the accounts and records exemption may be relevant here. Um, so what that means is but essentially if you're holding information and the only information that you're holding is what we would sort of dub as standard on an invoice, it's just basic contact details, um, then you don't need to register, but you'd need to make sure um, that you need to make sure that um, that's all that you're holding. But we do also have a tool on our website that you can use where you can self assess really whether you do need to register. Um, and I can see it's 11.29, but there's just one more question I want to squeeze in. So in the previous example with an unauthorised person, would that be a reportable breach? As we mentioned uh, before, it depends on the sensitivity. So you'd need to think about those effects. Um, on the person, on person C, um, and decide whether it's likely or unlikely to result in a risk to them. 